50% reduction in child poverty, 50% reduction in pensioner poverty, and about 25% reduction in working age adult poverty. Now that's something which no policy has managed to achieve for generations. Everybody has to have a job. Everybody has to work. You have to work. If you don't work, you don't get a wage. If you don't get a wage, you can't buy food. You can't get housing. You can't do the things that you want to do. You have to get a wage in order to live a meaningful life, just to survive. But what if you didn't? And that's the core idea behind a universal basic income, a UBI, a policy, a proposal that's captured the imagination over the last decade. It's been put forward by a number of people, and it seeks to decouple a wage from work, saying that everybody, regardless of who they are and what they do, should receive a certain fixed payment every week. Now, this is a hugely challenging proposition for many people because work gets to the very heart of our civilization. We identify with our jobs. We think that if somebody doesn't work or if they don't work hard enough, that they're morally faulty, that they're bad people. We have a discourse in politics around scroungers, strivers and skivers. So why on earth, politically, would you want to give people money for doing absolutely nothing? It's an interesting question. And that's why I'm interviewing today's guest, Will Strong. He's the founder of a think tank, Autonomy, and one of the major policy areas they look at is a universal basic income and what it can do. Will Strong, welcome to Downstream. Thanks for having me. So for people who aren't aware of who you are, what your work is, which is obviously immensely important, otherwise we wouldn't be talking to you here on Navarra Media, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. So I'm the director of research at Autonomy, and we're a not-for-profit think tank that's based across the UK, but we're, you know, we have an office in London. We focus on the future of work, so that's anything from the future of care work, the future of automation, four-day weeks, um, anything around kind of green jobs, et cetera, et cetera. But we also kind of take work in a more holistic sense, so thinking about things like welfare um, and kind of things like uh, climate and how that's going to, those kind of climate kind of impacts are going to be kind of dovetailing with some of the crisis of work that we identify today. So it's a, it's a very broad remit, obviously. Um, we have a team of 15. We have a dedicated data unit made up of four or five kind of data specialists, mathematicians, physicists. They're producing all sorts of interesting stuff, which maybe we'll talk about later. Um, but we also have a kind of consultancy team purely around the four-day week, for example. So we go into firms, um, you know, help them run for working time experiments, help them kind of move to shorter working hours arrangements. And of course, with other organizations, we kind of collaborated on the world's largest four-day week trial last year. Um, very happy that Navarra is a four-day week company. Um, I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, and yeah, I think, I think today we're talking about UBI, which is also one of our kind of main policy areas. Let's talk about universal basic income. That's mm -hmm. why we've got you in today. It's a very, um, it's, a big, it's a big topic. You know, lots of people are talking about it on the left, on the right. It's one of those things that you'll get, you know, Reddit threads, which are probably being read by tens of millions of people. Explain the fundamental ideas behind a universal basic income. Sure. Okay. So let's just be very clear about what we mean here, because most forms of basic income, you know, differ in some way. There's a kind of, I guess there, there might be an earth form somewhere, but ultimately, you know, let's just be very clear about what we mean by basic income so we can kind of go off that, off, off that basis, basically. So a cash payment, a flat cash payment that goes to every resident in a country, um, it's individualized, um, it is at a certain level, and I guess there's debates about what level there should, we should start with the basic income, but usually it's just, you know, just, it's discussed as covering a certain basic um, set of needs, um, and it's unconditional, that's the most important thing, really. So, you know, you're not kind of, being, there's no means testing as we currently have in the welfare system. There's no kind of tracking as to you know how you're going to spend this money and so on. So that's that's the kind of the basic idea. Obviously, this some form of this has been around for a long time. Thomas Paine um, kind of floated as much. Uh, Martin Luther King was into the idea. Bertrand Russell and so on and so forth. John Stuart Mill, in fact, as well. You know, all sorts of different people throughout history. Now, the case for I mean, there's multiple. I had to categorize them in kind of two different ways. Basically, there's a kind of ameliorative. Um, this helps solve the problems of today. And there's a kind of, here's what it could generate as in terms of kind of culture or innovation and so on. And so I think for the first part, um, it's an engine of equality. It would basically be one of the biggest redistributive programs um, for uh, over 50 years. Um, effectively, you know, most of the, the progressive forms of basic income are, are kind of funded by 
progressive taxation, whether that's income plus wealth or just re, 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 you know, shifting income tax around. Um, so it'd be a huge redistrib- redistributive policy and any progressive should really get on board with that, at least in principle. So in one sense, kind of the equality at, at that scale. Of course, gender equality is a massive one as well. You know, an individualized payment is very different to a lot of welfare systems where they give it to the head of the household, which can, you know, be really, you know, not conducive for, or at least it can, it can be conducive for kind of domestic um, abuse, abusive relationships, for example. So giving um, you know, women in particular an individualized payment could be a real lifeline in some sense. And this is what Amelia Womack, the MP, always emphasizes. I think in general, you know, we want to talk about poverty reduction. You know, even some most more modern, uh, even some of the more modest um, uh, models have you know, huge effects on poverty. Um, so that's something which I think we shouldn't sniff at. You know, if we're talking about implementing this, you know, in the course of a, of a term or or even shorter, that's a huge impact right there and then. And there are many more. I mean, maybe I'll pick out a couple of other examples um, of of kind of the cases for, and I think, or maybe some of my favorite ones. I think there's something about crisis resilience that's really important here. I think in the last three years, we should really learn from that, whether it's the COVID pandemic or the cost of living crisis. I think we're going to be going through, you know, a few more of these as the century goes on, I'm sure you'll agree. And I think having something where an infrastructure, we can kind of turn the taps on uh, at varying levels to kind of kind of a, almost a counter cyclical measure in a way. I think that's really important. I think it will be really important, whether it's tech disruption or climate change or industrial transitions, anything like that. So I think Thinking about the role of cash in that sense, rather than kind of other measures or alongside other measures, is really important. And then finally, and maybe we can, I'd be interested to speculatively talk about this. You know, the future of cash beyond neoliberalism, the future of cash beyond capitalism. Maybe what do we, you know, what do socialists think about cash? You know, I think there's some ideas about labor tokens and and and, and so on and so forth. But I think if we have this time horizon, let's say just of the 21st century, let's get through that. Cash is probably going to be around. So how do we make that, you know, that kind of system, um, whether you want to call it democratic or more justly distributed or less kind of um, painful to kind of get at, let's say, what does that look like? And, and, and what's the role of cash there? I think UBI does speak to that to some extent to say, well, you know, maybe people shouldn't have incomes purely if they can work or purely if they can prove they're looking for work. Maybe income should be a bit more of a right. There were some, um, I don't know if it's a pilot, probably a program, but I remember this being cited by Rutger Bregman in his, his first major book, Utopia for Realists, which for me was really eye-opening about UBI because it's just full of these anecdotes and, and data. And you mentioned women. You know, I think some of the, the numbers around uh, women who are subject to abusive relationships, just giving them a cash payment makes such a big difference. And again, I think with homelessness as well, just giving homeless people a cash mm. payment, which they can rely on to get themselves out of the situation, is so much better than "quote unquote" wraparound services. Which obviously you want those too, uh, but actually, even though the political discourse is to say don't trust these people, they're useless, they're feckless, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you empower them with some resource, and it turns out they they turn themselves around relatively quickly. Most of them, anyway. But I suppose there's a distinction between giving cash payments to certain categories of the population, women uh, leaving an abusive relationship, or the homeless and everyone else. So, I mean, I'll go on the on the feminist argument, mm-hmm. which I've always found really interesting, mm-hmm. which is a UBI would help remunerate care work, mm-hmm. which, we, which we don't do. And I think we agree on that. In care work, for people sort of watching care work, what the hell are you talking about? You know, you don't have capitalism without laborers. And you don't have laborers without people raising children. And Homo sapiens takes a very long time to raise a child. You know, we're not, we're not even like other primates. It takes 16 to 18 years to have something resembling a fully functioning adult. And that's a huge investment in time. And that's overwhelmingly done by women. And they are in no way rewarded for that or even, like I say, remunerated. Now, a UBI with, say, care work, whether it's young people, whether it's older people, will allow people to care for others and they won't suffer as a result because they'll still be able to have access to cash. But then I suppose the counter argument is, well, if that work is being done overwhelmingly by women, which it is, and I think this is a good argument, by the way, for UBI, care work, I think it's a good argument for it, then why would you give it to men? You know, surely that's an argument for saying, well, if this is overwhelmingly the role of women in society and they suffer in the labor market because they have to have children, et cetera, et cetera, why don't we just give a cash payment of, I don't know, £600 a month to all women, you know, from 18 to... 65. And I'm not just saying that to be woke. It's a provocation, but mm-hmm. I think it's it's getting at what you said with regards to the sort of feminist argument. Yeah. So I think basically, let's unpack this a little bit. I think there's a few things in there which I want to pick up on really. So I don't think the argument for basic income is to say, 
this will allow for more care work to be done. In some ways, it's saying lots of care work is being done. A lot of it needs support, you know, and I think, you know, I agree with you that, you know, for example, uh, you know, care work is a, is also a profession. It's a paid job as well. But for those who are doing informal care, which is what we're really talking about here, yeah. it's not really about allowing them to do that care. It's saying they, they, sh they should get that support because they're providing something which is, you know, universally kind of recognized and it's, it's, a, it's valuable in itself. I don't think it, I think a slightly different argument to saying they should be paid, for example, um, per hour for that. In some sense, it's saying, look, that value is almost unaccountable because there's all sorts of, you know, different kinds of care work going on, whether you say for old, older people or, you know, in the household, in the family and so on. I think universal basic income is a kind of just general flaw, which is as a universal, it kind of captures that stuff. People don't fall through the cracks, but ultimately, you know, is, is not kind of, let's say, um, a, uh, a very like specific accountancy for every single bit of care work that's being done. So on the one hand, I think it's not really about allowing them to do care work. It's just, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, recognizing in monetary terms that that care work is being done uh, across the board by all sorts of different people. And that's why I think, you know, we don't want to go down the route of saying, actually, women are carers, they should be paid. Men are not carers, they should not be paid. Cause... But that is true, though, isn't it? I mean, if you if you look at, <clears throat> if we're just, just empirically, I'm not saying it should be the case, but if you look at sort of 70s campaigners, people like Silvio Federici, mm -hmm. Maria Rosa della Costa, they argued for something, again, quite provocatively, uh, well, Maria Rosa della Costa did wages for housework. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that men go out and earn wages in, in the labor market and we have to do work like raise children, clean the house, yada, yada, yada. And we should be paid for that. Now, they weren't being entirely serious because they obviously wanted women in the labor market too, to a significant extent. Mm -hmm. They wanted to pay equality and whatnot. But I suppose it, it, there is a strong feminist argument to say women are disadvantaged in the labor market to a significant extent contra men. Mm -hmm. They have to take out significant amounts of time from the labor market to have children. They are they are paid less because of pay discrimination. I suppose. So, like I say, if you buy all that, which I do, that surely is an argument. Let's get Maria Rose de la Costa in the room. You know, from forty years ago, she say, "Yes, I want a UBI, but just for women." No, so I think I mean, so those days are realities. I know we shouldn't have women doing all that care work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we do. No, I think I think it's a, it's a really important point. And actually, Kathy Weeks makes a really good argument, saying that you know. Even though people like Federici, they, 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 in their more nuanced arguments, Federici, for example, says, look, we're talking, we wanted to kind of disentangle the housework from the house worker to say actually housework is something that anyone can do, but we, in, in the end, it's women who end up doing it. That work should be remunerated as a way of allowing it to be a job, anyone's job that potentially they could refuse, for example. Kathy Weeks makes the argument, look, so really we're not talking about, you know, targeting women. We're talking about, you know, revaluing work and kind of giving monetary support for workers full stop. A basic income allows you to, instead of saying, you're only getting this for doing housework, you're, instead of saying, actually, it kind of makes it more loose and broadens it out so that actually kind of it, it, it talks about all sorts of other kinds of things without stick, like kind of tying it to women specifically. The other point I wanted to make about that is stigma, basically. I think when you have targeted benefits, when you have targeted cash transfers, you, as, as we do have right now, right, if you target certain groups with it and say, okay, um, you're going to get this money, other people aren't, you can then start having this kind of cleavage between those who kind of earn their money, um, i.e. through a job, and that's what the kind of traditional way of thinking about earning your keep, earning your livelihood, and those who, you know, only get it, only get money because they're cleaning at home or working at, you know, kind of caring for people at home. And I think that stigma is something that universal basic income really does tackle um, or would tackle, you know, and I think that's something which we, we kind of miss when we say, oh, shouldn't we target a certain group um, because... That they need it most, for example. I think that's that's we, we all know how the right wing press works. For example, just attacking people who scroungers, skivers, and so on. So I think that's another feature which kind of should play into this. Basically, we don't want there to be a scrounger culture again, layered on top of gendered kind of inequalities, mm -hmm. right? Just the record, I'm a big one thing we agree on because we'll get onto this universal basic services and UBI. We can agree on the universal bit. So that's just a provocation. In terms of the pilots which we have, and you said there's this pilot in the UK which is forthcoming, hugely interesting. We've had some pilots already. What's the evidence in regard to what a UBI does for incentives to work? When you give people these cash payments, do they work more or do they work less? So there's two examples here I think are worth talking about. One is the income scheme from the 1970s in Canada, where some researchers or at least some kind of interpreters of the results said, look, um, you know, young men dropped out of the labor market. Um, and actually, when you dug into them, and Evelyn Forger is the kind of world expert on that particular experiment, you dug into them, it's interesting because basically these young men, you know, initially before the experiment, before the income experiment, 
they were going to the labor force, you know, very young, straight out of high school, you know, even dropping out of high school to going into the labor market. With the income scheme, you know, having this kind of income floor, they actually went and retrained and went, you know, kind of you know, went into education for a few more years. And that was something which, you know, their family members, their mothers and so on were like absolutely over the moon about. They're saying, finally, we actually can have our sons, in this case, sons, um, you know, getting on in life rather than just having to work in some kind of mindless low paid job which they were tending to go to just to earn the keep for the family. So that's one example I thought was quite interesting. So they had they had really the ability to set long term goals and say strategically, this is what I want to do with my life and it'll mean long term net benefit, etc. Yeah. That's exactly. the result of UBI. Absolutely, yeah. And that was that was that's that's the result from that that's one of the results, many results in that mean income scheme, you know, reduced hospital visits and so on. But particularly around labor market outcomes, on the one hand, more young men didn't go into the labor market at such an early stage, but actually that's a good thing in terms of their long-term plans. They weren't just getting any job they could find in order to kind of bring income to the family. So that's one example. The other example, you know, kind of famously now is the Finnish um, UBI uh, experiment, which went on for two years. Um, interestingly, under a conservative government, um, and, you know, we, we have colleagues at Demos Helsinki um, who we, you know, we, we're working with right now, and they helped kind of administer these pilots. The employment outcomes are negligible. And the, the papers report this as some kind of failure. Of the how, many, how many people were involved? Uh, I, threw, I think it's a, it's a few hundred okay. being paid about 600 euros a month. Okay. I, I, I would ask everyone to go look, read the report on that. To make, to, you know, don't yeah. check my figures. But um, effectively, you know, the, the, the employment outcomes are negligible, which actually I think is, a, is, is you know, it's, it's an interesting result because it's, it's not, it was reported as a failure of the, you know, of, of this piece. But obviously, UBI is not meant to be a kind of stimulus to the job market or kind of like getting people into work. It's 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 about economic security. It's about resilience and so on. But nonetheless, it's interesting that actually people still worked, but you know they had such huge benefits um, recorded on around things like mental health, trust in the state, trust in state services. That's kind of interesting. You know, they asked these questions about how do you feel about your relationship with the community, with the state, and so on. So all those things improved. But the, the press, you know, kind of said that the failure in Finland is you know, not that many more people joined the labor market after UBI, um, which is, you know, kind of shows you exactly kind of how this idea provokes outrages and is still quite new, basically. It's really funny you say that because there was this clip of you on Good Morning Britain with Michelle Dubry, the first winner of The Apprentice, who I actually, in a way, I quite like because she can be quite contrarian, but in a, in a meaningful way, you know, and I, I think she's, for me, she's like the average Tory or Labour right voter who's just going to be sceptical of stuff like this. And I think if you can persuade her, you can probably persuade quite a few of them. And she was just saying, look, this is ridiculous. You're giving money for nothing. And this is just going to, you know, why would, why would anybody get out of bed in the morning? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something you hear quite a lot when you talk about this to sort of people, I suppose, outside the policy, the policy bubble? Yeah, to some extent. Although I do think the idea of basic income, once you just tell someone what the idea is, they often kind of digest it as, okay, well, this obviously, that's part of the, the point of this. That actually, it's not really about making people do something for work. And then they try and think about other rationales. But yes, it's a, it's a, it's a classic um, kind of initial response. Um, I think she's actually the winner of the second season of The Apprentice. Oh, fuck. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, no, no I, th I think he's the second, but I mean, that's, that's by Let's the by. Oh, no, that was going to be a funny, that was, that was, part, that was part of the joke, oh, particular segue. I, that I said, fuck. So, I, mean, I, I can't believe I remember that, because I remember I, she was, <laughs> and there was a funny little detail when he said first, I was like, actually, I think she, I, I didn't even watch the second season, but I, I knew that for some reason, because I did my research, obviously. Mm. Okay. Um, I love how you know that. The second season of The Apprentice. I've never watched it. Yeah. I mean, nor have I, but when, when I knew I was going up against her on Good Morning Britain, um, yeah, I did my research, saw that she was both a politician for the Reform Party, uh, winner of the second season, and uh, now host on GB News. And actually, after the uh, Good Morning Britain um, uh, appearance, her team asked me to come on GB News um, you know, for, for, for a proper discussion. But I wonder if that proper discussion would be you know, effectively a kind of um, trial by fire. Um, but, you know, I think, I think in some sense, I think it's really important that we actually put these ideas out there as provocations for people who just really, you know, are, are going to be absolutely outraged by this. And let's engage in an argument. And you saw in that clip, right, that we started talking about, you know, how do you fund this and so on and so forth. And ultimately, that's not, that became irrelevant for, for Michelle because she started shout, just shouting that you're deluded, basically. And that became something which, you know, is, is kind of indicative of, 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 of what the kind of thing that you'd be like as a proposition can do, basically. <laughs> so people stop thinking rationally. Well, I think basically people think this, this, this idea, I mean, the reason why I think this is, a, this is a, almost like a non-reformist reform is because it goes against, you know, 
effectively the entire the entire history of welfare out of out of work relief or unemployment benefits and so on. And that's a key part of our kind of industrial, you know, capitalist socioeconomic system, right? Yeah. That is it's a key part. So if you start saying actually, how about the opposite of that? And let's see how that goes. Yeah. People suddenly say, well, no, you definitely can't do that because we've never done that. And that's something which you know, it goes against, you know, not only the system itself, but as part of that, the ideology around work. Right? Yeah, so, my identity. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's why it just, it really kind of, you know, and you see all the YouTube videos now that have been made around this, and it's, 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 it polarizes, but at the same time, you know, there are, it's, I, I stand by the idea, it's a strong, it's a strong argument for it. It's interesting with Michelle as well, because I, I mean, I get to talk to her quite a lot, and she's somebody who really prides herself on hard work, She's, she's got a really interesting backstory. It came from a really, had a really, you know, has had a tough time. Um, and so for somebody like that, where graft is so central to who they are, I mean, good for you, you know, it's, I'm, I'm happy for you. But then you, all of a sudden somebody's coming on and say, well, actually, you know, this sort of pillar of your sense of self and identity, you know, maybe we shouldn't build society. Like that. <laughs> because it does seem to elicit these really irrational responses. You, you can just say, I don't agree with it. Or I think we should do this instead. But you do get people often, you know, yeah, yeah, viscerally yeah. angry at it. In a way, they wouldn't be around public ownership of rail or, you know, high taxes on the rich. And I, no, absolutely. And I think, I think you know, an interesting contrast here is, I mean, I think it's, I think we all agree, you know, if, if you kind of look at the, you know, look at history here, there's, there's always been certain groups, for example, that are seen as, you know, dependents. Um, and we know we talk, and that's really about taking state income, right? And that's, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. the, the claimant, um, whether it's the housewife dependent on her husband and so on and so forth in colonial times, you know, the kind of the native and all this kind of stuff, this all framed as, as basically, you know, dependency and, and kind of in some sense, um, a burden or whatever. But we don't talk about, for example, you know, in the, in this, in, the, in nearly the same way, we don't talk about, you know, military contractors, tax breaks for the rich or, you know, PhD students who get state funding. We don't call them dependents and scroungers and so on, but they're still getting state money. It's always reserved for a certain cohort. Right. And that's why, you know, getting rid of that stigma and, and actually saying, well, look, maybe we're all interdependent in all sorts of ways and therefore we should all have a floor to stand on rather than saying some people are dependent so on the rest of our hard work, you know, and so forth. And, and so I think, I think that's what this debate really brings up and maybe that's why people get so angry because they realise actually, you know, their worldview isn't, it isn't, it isn't the case. I remember that story a while back. It was probably a few years ago now. Um, I can't remember it was 52 or 48%. Maybe I'm thinking of the Brexit referendum. But basically, it was, it was approximately 50% of the country is, you know, Dependent on the state. I don't know if you saw this the like, like, mail or telegraph saying, you know, forty-eight percent of people require, you know, you're like, well, yeah, you're talking about people who can't yet work, who aren't in the labor market, people who are under sixteen. You're talking about pensioners, you're talking about the long term. Yeah, that's that's a lot of people, yeah. right? Especially in an aging society. And it's just people go crazy. The idea of, you know, the idea that oh, this person isn't in the labor market, forty eight hours, forty hours a week with uh, five days a week, 340 days a year, or whatever it is, it sort of, it drives them up the wall. And there is clearly a, a there's clearly a cultural aspect to this policy, yeah. which even if you don't, even if you don't see it being implemented in the next five to 10 years, which I, I, I think is unlikely, maybe you've got a different, you know, strategy on it. I think initiating that conversation around work, why we work and what work is for is so hugely important. In terms of, um, the pilots and stuff, because I think this is where you're going to really add value because you know all this stuff, all the, the data and the pilots and all the studies that have been done. Do people drink more? Do they gamble more? Like, do they do they do do they do more quite unquote, like bad stuff? Because like you know, people when they relax start to drink, right? I presume if we had a three day weekend, people people probably would go out more. So what happens with UBI and those kinds of things? Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at the, exactly like the consumption data on this. I think some of these pilots use kind of time use diaries or, you know, kind of personal uh, reporting and so on. I've never seen anything where there's been excessive, let's say, bad, as you, as you put it, um, kind of behavior. I mean, the truth is, when people are given a kind of base level of income, they, you know, tend to spend on stuff they need as well, you know, so there's always going to be a mix. I do think... So that's that's kind of what I've got to say about the data. I would say go into some of these these papers um, and and kind of see for yourself. I do worry that, for example, that question is is one which kind of comes from um, not not in your case, but I'm saying it's a question which effectively is, is again part of this culture of worrying. What do people do with their money? Mm. You know, you know, do bosses worry what their um, you know staff are, are spending their wages on? Well, Henry Ford used to, right? He used to get inspectors to kind of inspect. Um, that his kind of employees' lives to see whether they're being frugal or not, and so on and so forth. But we, that's scandalous to us today, right? And so I think the idea of unconditional basic income is something that does, again, 
provoke this question and say, well, you know, what are people going to do with it? Do they spend it on the stuff which I think is ethically dubious? Um, this is not quite the same as your question, but again, going back to Rutger Bregman in his book, he, he makes this kind of, kind of pithy kind of comment saying, if you just say to someone, look, if someone gave you an income of X amount, what would you do? Uh, and you say, well, I, I, I'd, I'd probably learn a language or I'd, I'd start an initiative with my friend or I'd be able to do this or that. And then you say, well, what do other people do? And I say, oh, they're lazy and they'll drink and they'll do, do mm. terrible things. And I think there's part of that in the culture of, of questioning what, if we give people money, they'll just do, you know, what do they do with their time type thing. I know that wasn't really where you're coming from because it is just an interesting question, what would people do? But too often it comes from a place of kind of a suspicion, again, at those who didn't earn that money. No, I mean, I mean, inclined to agree that people, I think most people would overwhelmingly be more productive. But it is, like you say, it's this interesting paradox with a lot of progressive policy where people support it, but then they think that there'd be a free rider problem with other people. You know, I, I wouldn't behave like that. You know, I wouldn't manipulate or exploit the NHS, but those other people over there, they'll, they'll do that. And it's also interesting that, I, but I suppose it is a live question because ultimately this would be public money given to individuals. Mm. It couldn't even necessarily be, you know, gambling or drinking. It might be that you might be buying lots of books. You know, you might really love buying secondhand books. And, you know, Harry or Sally over there says, what a waste of my money. <laughs> so I, I wonder, like, what, again, that would do for it. But again, it's such a big policy. It recalibrates a lot of this stuff. So I suppose the conversation about what you do with your own cash. And actually, that's again, that's one of those things where there's not a right-left divide on it. You often talk to conservative voters or whatever, and they're just as likely to say, it's your money, do what you want kind of thing. Um, they can be, you know, quite censorious, but, you know, so can some people on the left as well. Mm -hmm. How much does all this cost? Because obviously you're talking about massive interventions. What are the numbers looking like for the UK? Yeah, so I guess as I, I should caveat here that there are a number of different models, right? But the model which is my preferred kind of introductory basic income is around £270 billion per year gross, right? Lo a big chunk of that gets taken away when we eliminate child benefits and, and state pensions because what this this kind of basic income model that I'm talking about. And here, um, full disclosure, I'm referring to Howard Reed and Stuart Lansley's 2022 study for uh, Compass and the basic income conversation. Now, they have like three different models, but they obviously, and we've done this before as well, you want to be kind of making sure that the basic income doesn't touch a whole range of current benefits, you know, bereavement, uh, disability, PIP benefits, and so on. But it does get rid of things like job seekers allowance, child benefits, and pensions. They get replaced, right? So you have that gross figure. Quickly with child benefit, is that because the child would also be in receipt of the UBI? The UBI would be given to, to the parent in the same way that child benefits are given to the parent. Right. So, I mean, in some sense, you could, you could, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a decision to be made. When does the child get to a certain age when they get there? Sure. Um, but you, you'd be in receipt. So a family of four would have four UBI incomes, right? Yes, exactly. And uh, thanks for reminding me, actually, that it's important to, when we think about the benefits to families, we can think about it as a unit now, given they all, all stack up. So basically, that gross figure gets vastly reduced by around 100, 114 billion pounds, simply by kind of get, kind of replacing those benefits. After that, their system rejigs the tax bands, basically. So they have no net increase in taxation, but a reorganization of the existing tax bands in a, in, into a kind of progressive screen, scheme. So that's not even adding wealth taxation, for example. Now, that scheme is a modest basic income. That's 63 pounds a week for adults, around 40 pounds for, for, for kids, and about 100 um, 185 for state pension and that probably needs to be slightly updated now given that I think the pension's gone a bit higher those amounts seem meagre but for a year for a family of four that you just the, the kind of unit that we just mentioned that's £10,000 extra a year so that's nothing to be sniffed at and that those also have the same effects on poverty that I mentioned at the start so we're talking about a 50% uh, reduction around 50% reduction in child poverty 50% reduction in pension of poverty and about 25% reduction in working age adult poverty. Now, that's something which no policy has managed to achieve for generations. Before we go any further, I would like to highlight the fact that Navarra Media can only produce these kinds of interviews thanks to the kind generosity of our supporters. We're a four-day-week employer, but in those four days, we like to work pretty hard. And we think it's important to do the things that we do. If you agree with that, help us produce more content just like this by going to navarramedia.com forward slash support. Broadly, we are a political organization. We're quite open about that. And we can't build a different kind of politics and experiment with new kinds of policies, just like a UBI or a four-day week, without a different kind of media. If you agree, go to navaramedia.com forward slash support. So let's get this straight. That's how much again? 300 and? The gross. gross. Yeah. 274. 
So it's two seven four. So hold up, because you said three twenty. You said three hundred or something in the beginning, no? No, two seven four billion gross is gross. So okay, so my apologies. So two seven four gross, and you're saying net uh, net zero. As in, as in, it goes down. So 100, so 114 billion gets taken away roughly from yeah. getting rid of child benefits, pensions, adult, and working age uh, job six allowance. Yeah. After that, rejigging the tax, tax uh, rejigging the tax bans and national insurance contributions, and then you get to just actually a slight gain of, of, of around three million to make sure you can cover admin costs. That's the first model. After that, you then... so it wouldn't cost anything. No, that that's they, the, the the thing is with these researchers, right? Basic income researchers. They've had years of people saying this is unaffordable. So what's happened, the people like Stuart Lansley, Howard Reed, who've worked on this for ages. Howard Reed, by the way, is, is um, the guy behind the uh, tax and benefit simulator that IPPR use, that we've used at Autonomy. They've had decades of basically people saying this is unaffordable policy. So they, they strive as much as possible to make this as uh, fiscally neutral um, as possible. And so Model 1 is minimal amounts. And we've done this in, for our project in Wales. We had, we had a project um, uh, around um, the Future Generations Commissioner in Wales. We modelled, we used a similar model for modelling what this basic level would be in Wales. I mean, we made it essential to the project to make sure that we had a table, and you can look at it on, our, on the report, which shows where the rejigging it all comes from. And in fact, actually, we added like a few billion from wealth tax. But actually, this system encompass no wealth tax is involved in that first one. It's just a rejigging. That's incredible. So you're saying for a family of four, they'd be 10 grand up a year. That's really, really impressive. I mean, I suppose one of the points I'd want to make is people say, well, uh, UBI is unaffordable. I've said that. Those people aren't saying £63 a week. So let's talk about a more extensive UBI because one criticism of something like that, a I income mean, from the left could be that it's a bit like what you get in uh, Germany with top up of people on low wage, which is not universal. But what you can then see is, well, we top up your, we, we top up what is effectively a low pay economy um, with these cash transfers, and we will wind down other public services. I'm not suggesting that's what you're saying. You make it sound very attractive, by the way. You know, something of a convert almost immediately. <laughs> but but in terms of the that that criticism, they say, well, that kind of UBI can't work for those reasons. We'd have to have something far more extensive. So how much would a, a, a more generous UBI cost? We have to have, do we have numbers in regard to that? There are, um, as I say, I've, I've, I've stuck to my favorite model, which is the kind of the introductory one, because I think it's feasible and a game changer in terms of equality. There are, in that same paper, Model 2 and Model 3, which are much more extensive. So the amounts for uh, Model 3, which is the, the kind of, let's say, further down the line, more extensive model, is around £224 a week for adults, which is you know four times as much, for example. For that costing, which they have done, there's all sorts of other kind of, you know, wealth taxation and other bits and bobs that need to be kind of, you know, configured. And also the tax system will become radically, you know, reconfigured. Mm -hmm. So you kind of start moving away from immediate political feasibility there. But nonetheless... Well, the, the threshold would disappear, right? That, the present tax threshold, which people don't pay, you know, if you don't earn less than 12 grand a year or whatever it is, that would disappear, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so all these models, you know, that's something which they are the tax experts on. And I think that's something which... You know, it, I think I'm very happy that the basic income movement has these people because ultimately it'll fall down immediately if you say, well, I don't know how much it costs. I don't know how to, to fund it. Um, <laughs> but people like, you know, Stuart and Howard and, you know, I, I know I'm being a bit of a fanboy here, but they are they are they are wonderful for the movement. So I, I don't know the total cost. It's, again, it's in the report of the full of the kind of full, let's say, Model 3 scheme. Um, it will be extensive. It will require a lot of resources. These things cost money. That model, though, does basically get rid of poverty full stop. Um, so that's the kind of that's why they had it as an, on the more ambitious end. Right. On the point you made before around people saying, "Well, look, we'll have to kind of wither public services and have a kind of um, you know uh, have to have like trade offs and so on." Absolutely true that there will be you know policy decisions have to be made. Um, something like a basic income, something like unconditional cash, I think will have to come into being in this century. Either if we're serious about tackling the welfare conditionality as a human rights issue, which is what Philip Aston from the UN. You know, he came to the UK, evaluated universal credit, said this is basically almost like a violation of human rights. If we're going to tackle that, we need to, it'll be some form of unconditional income, some form of it. So we have to be serious that, okay, well, let's think about these other things, but let's also recognize that unconditional income is probably going to have to be the direction of travel if you want a progressive system, because we definitely don't have one now, haven't had one ever. Think about the workhouse. That's, that's the case. So let's think about how we do that rather than saying, actually, we can't have, we still have to have a punitive um, kind of uh, cruel and ineffective welfare system uh, because public services. I mean, it's an argument which I think I think 
it shows a lack of ambition and, and, and one which, which ultimately is kind of saying we can't have nice things because governments are bad, basically. We'll get on to this, the UBS versus EBI, but quickly on the numbers, because there is this pilot which you're um, semi-involved in, or are you complete? are you overseeing it? Who's doing the data collection? This one with regards to East Finchley in London and Jarrow in the northeast of England. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a coalition of actors here. So we have uh, researchers from Northumbria University, Matthew and Elliot Johnson, we have big, big local, the great, the, the, the Grange branch, and um, the one in Jarrow, um, and ourselves at Autonomy. So, our basic income conversation is now part of Autonomy. It was at Compass, and now it's at Autonomy. Cleo Goodman is the lead on this. So, we'll be doing with the academics at Northumbria the research, the coordination, and so on. And there'll be on the ground kind of uh, groups as well working on this. You know, it's a community led pilot design, right? It's two years of consultation. Big local kind of consulted with a number of communities, and then Jarrow and East Finchley were those who are very keen on basic income in particular, so they were chosen as these pilot sites. Yeah, so these these are the pilots that got um, Michelle Dubry so vexed with you that morning mm-hmm. on that fateful morning on uh, on GMB. Now those people uh, will be paid. It's thirty people taking part. They'll receive monthly payments of sixteen hundred pounds each every month for two years. Now, if you were to roll that out across thirty eight million working age people in the UK. Uh, which is the number of working age people. So obviously, you know, I think 68 million people and 38 million are in that bracket. That would be £19,200 a year, and that would be a total cost of £730 billion. Now, you've said things around, you'd obviously, if this was to be rolled out as a, as a national policy, you would be removing things like child benefit, uh, JSA, there are some changes with regards to tax and so on. Have you done modelling with regards to that pilot? Because obviously, this is hugely exciting, you could have 30 people whose lives are transformed and then you get asked questions about, well, how feasible is this on a national scale? Mm-hmm. The start of your question there reminded me of, it was, it was like being back on GMB again. Now was Ed Ball's first line. Um, the latter part of your question, though, is um, a, very, a very good one. Um, and I think what the rationale is behind such a high amount, because you know, obviously, as you say, we, we've been talking about lower weekly amounts, lower monthly amounts. Such a high amount, you know, you might consider to be, let's say, a full basic income. You know, the yeah. the, the full utopian image of what a basic income might be. Um, that's important for us to to pilot. You know, spe- particularly on this micro pilot, right? There's only thirty people taking taking uh, taking part in this. On a micro pilot level, you know, you want to be kind of experimenting with the kind of optimal, um, you know, vision of this policy. Basically, I think we want to see what happens when it's 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 not just kind of a yeah politically feasible in the next five five ten years, let's say, or at least in terms of taxation feasible um we want to be piloting something which is like shows the full full idea and if you have an opportunity to do that i think you should really again you know i don't think i think an introductory basic income will be much lower and then it becomes an election kind of terrain uh, on who's going to raise it and who's going to reduce it basically and with that universalism which i think you know we both agree with i think you start low because it is it does cost money uh, and then you, you keep raising it and it becomes a yeah a, a kind of an election piece like the nhs well that's very convincing you're also involved in a four-day week. Why do we need a four-day week and the UBI? Because I suppose these are both really radical policies and to some extent trying to achieve the same thing. But clearly you think we should do both of them at the same time. Can you explain your thinking? Sure. I mean, I think one way of thinking about these two things and why I think they should happen at the same time is merely extending some of the more emancipatory progressive tendencies of social democracy, basically. Working time reduction, the major leaps and you know bounds that were made, the gains that were made in terms of reducing the working week, happened really you know at the start of the 20th century. Basically, you kind of fast forward to around just after World War II, construction, mining start moving to five day weeks and so on. And obviously, around the world there are different timelines, but nonetheless, big advances made then, um, and because there's a slowdown which happens after that. The direction of travel for everyone, from Keynes to trade unions and so on, was basically keep reducing the working week. You know, they used to be called wages slavery back in the, not not too long ago, about hundred years ago. Reducing the working week was an obvious aim for those moving into more democratic uh, kind of uh, society. Basically, that was a clear trajectory. The four day week is just the next step in that. It's been eighty years since we reduced the working week to to a five day week. So, in some sense, you can think of it as that's a sign of prosperity. That's a clear sign that we're, we're managing to develop um, our own well-being while also keeping you know, productive as a society and so on. So in that sense, the 40-week is just following that trajectory. Universal basic income is also following certain tendencies that have happened in that same period. So I'm talking about people like Eleanor Rathbone campaigning for child benefits. The reason why we have child benefits, the reason why benef- the beverage plan, according to the man himself, uh, included things like child benefits is because of the campaigning of people like Eleanor Rathbone. She was campaigning for more universal um, kind of 
kinds of benefits. She was interested in a mother's wage, the prefiguration of the wages for housework. She was interested in a widow's wage for those who are in World War I, they, their wives should be getting and the widows should be getting an income to kind of support themselves. All these different things were, were kind of, all these different campaigns, all these different kind of phenomena were, were pushing the bounds of what had traditionally been seen as a very conditional system or a very rigid working week of long hours, for example. So in, from my money, I think shorter working hours and UBI are just extensions of the direction of travel that more emancipatory, more progressive ends of social democracy were already pushing. So Navarro Media is already a four-day week employer. Should we do a three-day week? <laughs> I think so. What's, what's the end game here? What's the end game? Well, I think, I mean, I think to some extent, you know, there will be there will be hard limits to how much you can reduce the working week and maintain an operation, right? At the moment, that's obviously, as as we all well know, that depends on the conditions of society's technological advancement as well as its cultural um, elements too. I don't want to say, for example, that there are, you know, there are, for example, you know, limits to certain industries that can't go to four day weeks, for example. I think, in, or 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 let's say, you know, if you were in 1910 and you say, look. Five day weeks, like what's next? The four day week? Mm. Some point it's a matter of time, right? So I can't see that far ahead as to when, you know, the three day week becomes the norm as 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 the full time working week. What my job is is to understand how we can make that transition from the current working regime of the five day week as a norm. Obviously, you know, the T C points that out twelve percent of the country still work seven day weeks. Yeah. Um, but those you know, as a as a five day week norm, my job is to understand how can we transition sectors, the society as a whole, and individual companies to a better working time regime, which still maintains kind of you know a level of performance. I suppose it, the reason why I ask that is a sort of strange way of asking. I suppose is that if you're going from five to four to three, then one would infer that you view work as a bad thing, right? Now, I don't mean I don't mean wage labour. I don't you know which is obviously exploitative under capitalism, etc. But a job, some kind of a job is a bad thing. And the less you do of it, the more happy you'll be. And so I'm sort of interested in what do people do on those days they're not working then. So let's say we had the four day week. You've had some studies in regards to this. We know what it means in terms of work. They become more productive, like they become happier, etc. What are they doing on the days that they don't work? Before I answer that question, I think it's important to really just note that if we did move as a, let's say, even just as a country, the UK moved to a four-day week, that would just totally change the conversation and culture around work, basically. Suddenly, the balance between the time which you can freely determine what you do, um, who you see, what things you pursue, and the time when you're kind of under uh, pressure to deliver, whether it's from a boss or from if you're self-employed and so on, that shift from five to two to four to three is just huge. So I think in some sense, um, that already is something which I, I don't want to prefigure uh, or kind of preempt what people will do. In some sense, that's already massive. When it comes to you know, what people do in their spare time, I mean, we, we ask people in companies the whole time, you know, that's part of our study and evaluation. What do you do now that you have um, this extra time off? And it's just a big range, right? A lot of people say they, you know, they can finally, they take shorter working weeks, so they kind of take, they have 32 hours, but they shorten it, and they, kind of, they, they, they spread it across the week, I mean, and they can take their kids to school, and they really enjoyed that. Or, you know, in some of the work we did, um, uh, up north, we were talking to, to people in an organization there. They start their own brewery and so on. And I, and I don't want to make it out that everyone's really, really productive and they got all the innovate and so on and so forth. But there was a whole mix of, of people who, you know, did start new initiatives, who um, took up new hobbies. Some people just say, I just do my life admin. And then, so when it comes to the weekend, I am, my mind is clear of all the random bits and bobs that I needed to do. I don't just spend Saturday cleaning and then suddenly it's Sunday and then it's work again. So it just clears that space. And I think something which Helen Hester and I, in our new book, which is going to come out next year, we want to make sure that we don't, there's no prescription for what people should do. In some sense, the kind of eight hours for, for rest, eight hours for work, and eight hours for time for what we will is really important. What we will is in a kind of more abstract sense. So I'm less interested in what people do um, in the abstract. I'm definitely not interested in prescribing. I'm, I know you're not either. Are you a workaholic? Because what I find really interesting is that a lot of the people, like we have it here at Navarro Media, so it's, it's great to see it in real time and observe it. Lots of the people who really advocate for a four-day week love working. I found this. It's just really interesting. And they don't switch off like you know our, our operations guy. He's the guy that's a four-day week. He's the one that works the hardest. <laughs> Do you think there's something to that? I think there's a few things going on there. I mean, I, I, I should say, for example, that, you know, 
I'm very lucky, I think, that like actually what I like doing does in many ways dovetail with what I do for work, for an income, basically. And I'm very lucky in that sense. That's a, a great many people do not have that. So no, I do not say, I, I think a lot of people say, well, actually, I like my job, so work's not so bad. And then making that jump between I like my job, I guess work's not so bad, in, you know, or jobs aren't so bad in general, that jump is so common, but it's obviously it, it's, it's, a, it's a false logic. So I do enjoy my job. And I'm also the director of autonomy, one of the directors of autonomy, right? And that means that um, I do often think about autonomy in my spare time. Um, I do have hard and fast limits on my work time, though. I think when I first started autonomy, it was all a bit amorphous. Yeah, I was doing a PhD at the time. So when was work time? When was not work time? We've all, all the full timers at autonomy um, have successfully managed to kind of have a real, you know, kind of the rails are on in terms of work time. And I think that's important to come from the top, actually. We've worked with organizations who their directors, their, you know, the, the, those leading the organization, they don't really stick to it. And the rest of the, the rest of the team, mm. the rest of the team see that and they say, well, they're not really doing it. So do I have to, uh, do I have an expectation to work longer hours? Um, and also it doesn't really work because they're not doing it, for example. So we emphasize with leaders that they really need to make sure they stick to it and show it. Even if, for example, they're doing a call, the odd call on the Friday to the council or, or HMRC or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's, it's important to, 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 you know, to kind of, not show your team members that you're going above and beyond and doing longer the hours than they than I than than you should because and then therefore they should you know too and so on and so forth. So I think it's if you're a workaholic, if you love your job, that's great. You can still burn out and you can still ruin the culture of a shorter working week in the team. I'm not here speaking to Navarra directly. <laughs> no, I think it's so true. I think it's uh, the thing about leadership results. We we also, we're also um, we have a staff pay ratio of one-to-one. Every organization is paid the same. And I think a lot of people... Uh, I remember when I was at TED in, um, in Vancouver last year and I was talking to somebody, you know, some business guy, you know, lo- loads of money. And uh, he said, oh, you're socialists. You know, you say this, but then you do something else. I said, well, actually, no, we have a, we have a strict pay ratio of one-to-one. He went, wow, that's really... That's actually really impressive. He kind of then became suddenly interested. He said, does it work? And I said, not all the time. You know, right. so it's one of those where, and, and the reason why I say that is because actually it's quite punitive to managers. I'm not a manager, by the way. I, I, people think, oh, because I start, I'm not managing people. But what's interesting is when you have a, a staff pay ratio of one to one, that you realize and recognize management is in itself, obviously it's quite hard for that to say this sometimes, management, when done properly, is itself executive skills are really important and they really add value to organizations. They help you solve problems. Mm-hmm. They help your employees work more effectively. That's what they're meant to do yeah. anyway. Um, and I, I think it's a similar one with a four-day week, right? Like you said, with regards to leaders, if they feel they can't get all their work done in those four days, they'll do that bit extra, and they feel compelled to, particularly when they're not a flat uh, pay organization, mm-hmm. because they're paid a bit more. But what you're saying is actually it's critical they don't do that because it can just undermine the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Like, we've, we've, we've you know, I'm happy to say that... Um, all of the trials that we've seen from end to end have been successful, but we've also been involved at different ends of the pilot, which has been run independently by companies. We've evaluated pilot results. We've talked to staff. And in the case, one of the most common reasons why it was a mixed bag of results is because at the top, um, the director said, well, this is a 40 week for the company, but not for me. Mm. Um, and then the company, those as in the staff, yeah, they feel uncomfortable with that. They're not sure if there's an expectation there. They also believe in the idea less. So it's absolutely essential. It's so interesting. So, don't be asking with regards to autonomy. How does it work? What time do you guys start work? What days do you have off? How is this all organised? Yeah. So we we the general rule is that kind of be at your desk before nine. Um, but obviously, you know, there are um, you might start earlier. Therefore, you can finish earlier and so on. But we know that everyone's going to be at their desk at nine. Um, the full timers they have the choice for when they want to take their their fifth day off. But everyone takes it off on the Friday. The full timers. So Friday is kind of a non-work day in general, and the part-timers um, spread their hours across the week depending on when it's most useful for them. But they, they tend to be able to kind of get into a set pattern. Happy to say that last year we managed to kind of, and this is again not to put pressure on, on Novara here, but kind of what we think is a full shorter working hours policy, which is to add kind of parity for the part-timers. That means we gave them all a 25% pay rise because you need that's the equivalent of four-day weeks, five days pay, so everyone who's on two days a week, three days a week gets 25% uh, on top of that to make sure that they have parity with the full-timers. Um, so we I make... think we have something similar, don't okay. worry. I think with our freelancers, I think we worked out how to pay freelancers like staff, basically, because we're a four-day week employer. Right, okay. So Great, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think working hours, it's important, you know, I think 
anyone considering a four-day week in their organization you know, should know in advance that this does this is an opportunity to kind of tighten up processes to uh, kind of find out better ways of working together. And I think it, it does mean that communication has to be incredibly strong. Um, in our case, anyway, we find given that there's part-timers working at different hours and there's full-timers um, kind of in the mix there as well, it means that we're just highly organized. Um, and so I think, that it, I mean, I think, and while we, what other things would you want to know about our, our work? Well, I mean, that, that seems sensible to me. You say you basically have Fridays off. I suppose for us, that's a bit of a problem because mm. we have a show on Friday. So we have a show every day. And so it's an interesting mm -hmm. you know, some, yeah. some organizations don't have that not luxury, but some industries, you know, if you have a hospital, for instance, is the, is the classic example, you, you will always have to be open. Yeah, of course. I think, you know, and there's obviously ways around that, whether it's rotors or, you know, I used to work shorter working days. So I used to want to be abreast of kind of a number of processes across, you know, from Monday to Friday. So I'd work just over six hours a day to make, to kind of make up the 32 hours, basically. That was good. Because I could end early, I started. I started at ten, I, and, for, and for those reasons, it's wonderful. And as I say, some people we've worked with before, they they prefer that schedule so they can either pick their kids up or drop their kids off from, at school. So they like that kind of, you know, across the week. Having said that, moving to a strict four day week, so Fridays off, has been a game changer for me. The, you know, the progress on the book I'm writing has just gone you know, through the roof. Um, I'm yeah, I'm just reading a lot more. I'm exercising a lot more. I, it's just it, it's a clear cut working week for me, and I work pretty hard in those four days. As I, I feel very very productive, but the weekends, you know, very very quickly, and they're great. I mean, my three day weekend. So it, for me, it's been it's such a shift. But I recognise that some organisations it's much easier to do a shorter day. So you would you would personally advocate for that four day week as a week rather than I mean that's what I do personally is I sort of trim off a, a couple of hours each day. You think try the the Friday off thing or the Monday off or whatever works best and yeah uh, see if that works better for you. Hundred percent. As in, I would try it. I, I do I, again. You know, these things only work if they do work in your favor. You feel less stressed and so on and so forth. So if it turns out that actually this is not working, I, I need to be abreast of things or I need to be working. Then it's not the model for you. A trade union is going to support a policy which makes them somewhat irrelevant, and I suppose that does apply more to UBR than the four day week. I think you know trade unions originally advocated for the eight-hour day, so that should be relatively straightforward sort of continuation of what they were doing 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. But with UBI, I suppose the politics are quite interesting because you say, well, where's the political constituency for this? Who's going to drive it forward? So I think there's, there are a few constituencies where which can help drive this. I think the labor movement, for me, is, is a key one, even if it's not on the top of, their, top of the list right now. So I think let's not forget that things like the unemployed workers movements not only campaigned for jobs, but they also campaigned for the end of the means test. That was, as soon as the means test was being brought into things like labor exchanges, there was big pushback. You know, stop checking on me about whether I'm looking for a job, just give me my dole type thing. So the labor movement has in the past definitely campaigned for less conditionality in the welfare system. I think if you look back at those high points of, you know, labor movement strength, it's at times when the welfare system was probably at its peak kind of substantiveness and generosity. I'm talking about the 60s and 70s really, um, obviously, there are other peaks in the labor movement's history, but in moments when it was easy and there was less of a threat, it's easy to get cash from the benefit system and there's less of a threat to workers to, to become unemployed. At those moments, you know, you, you basically strengthen the, uh, the workplace voice, basically. So I think, for example, you know, it's very explicit. If you look at some of the debates between Beveridge and Churchill, and there weren't really debates, a lot of consensus there, sifting through the you know the kind of workforce with these labor exchanges the early universal credit system basically um and under you know, they, they, they wanted to kind of divide the workforce between deserving and undeserving kind of like allow them to be um kind of uh kind of weakened by threatening to be uh, by the threats of things like sanctions or the means test or unemployment i guess what i'm saying here is that unemployment as i think is structurally uh, essential to uh, discipline in the in the labor market and in, and in workplaces if you know that life on the dole life on universal credit is physically and uh and uh, mentally and then culturally quite demeaning and degrading and it's kind of been designed like that as well i think that is something which is a threat and the employers know that too they're gonna be you're gonna be out on your ass you know you, good luck finding another job and so on if you have a more substantive welfare system one with unconditional incomes that threat is blunted even at low amounts i, I would say knowing that money's coming in each month that threat is slightly blunted you know so I think the labor movement has it in its interests and has had in the past explicitly in its interest for having more generous welfare systems 
uh, less conditionality. Um, you know, let's not forget that original out-of-work insurance systems were trade unions. They trade unions set up their own insurance systems before the welfare system. So I think that's important to note. I don't think it's about competing for uh, members or competing for who who controls wages and so on. Um, it's a compliment to wages, right? I don't think we're going to get rid of wages anytime soon. The wages system. Um, what makes that wages system a little less um, charged with? You're going to lose your income if you're fired. Is a more substantive welfare system. So I think. So I think I'll just end on this. I think the labour movement has an interest in it. I think a whole other constituency is the disabled movement, disability movement. There's a whole history of these debates. In fact, between services versus income, the disability income group, for example, always argued that a kind of disability income should be something that comes without these checks and balances and so on. Um, there's others who argued against that. But given that the welfare system, the sharp end, is really affecting those who uh, have a disability of one kind or another, and let's not forget that that's about 20% of the people in this country have a disability of some kind or another. Doesn't mean it's um, doesn't mean they can't work in the labour market, of course, but disabled groups and those with disabilities, um, disabled people, they have an interest in making this welfare system much less cruel, much less um, kind of assuming about people's you know will, the willingness or not to work and so on and so forth. So massive reforms needed there. I think part of that is not is taking rid of, getting rid of sanctions. If you get rid of sanctions, you take the bite out of conditionality, you start moving towards an un, more unconditional system. So I think there's two constituencies there, labor movement as well as disabled people. I mean, I'm really interested in demographic aging um, mm. and society's getting older. You know, the median age in the UK right now is around 40, I think. The median is, you know, half of the country is below you, half of it's above you. It's a good way of working out an average. Um, and that number is ticking up. And obviously, the more it ticks up, the more old people we have in society. I think in 2020, globally, the number of people over 65 outnumbered the people under five for the first time ever. Right. So, we, you know, it's an incredible achievement, frankly, right? For any species, for the old to outnumber the young. And I think by 2050, we're going to have more people over 65 than under 14. So this is a really profound shift in, in society. Now, it's important to say not everybody is living longer because of health inequalities, actually average life, expectancy in this, in average life expectancy in this country has basically stood still for the last 10 years. But what you get is a growing section of the, the, the oldest old, people who are a bit more fortunate, a bit more affluent, you know, tend to be higher educated, etc., are living longer and longer and longer because health inequality is mapping onto economic inequality. And I think it does raise questions around things like the pension age, for instance, yes. um, as, as we proceed as a society. Pensions are very expensive things to do. And if we regularly see people living to 100, as is now the case in Japan, um, and it will be the case more and more over, over time, then clearly you can't, you're going to struggle with the retirement age of 60. You just are. And that's not an anti-socialist position. It's just a, you know, it's, a, you know, it's just, it's basic mathematical proposition is how do you fund this much time out of the labor market? And that's what I find so alluring about these two policies. So with a four-day week, you're saying, well, you could probably work a little bit longer in your life. I certainly would happily, happily exchange that if I had guaranteed good health into old age with a shorter working week because your entire sort of identity and your time isn't, isn't constrained and bounded by work. And, and, and with the UBI as well, I suppose you could view it as sort of contributions to pensions because we have a massive shortfall in private pensions. And it's a, it's a time bomb, frankly, for millennials down in this country. We now have a, 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 an elderly care model, which is basically own a home, mm. right? If you own a home, then after you retire, you won't have to pay rent and you can withdraw equity to pay for elderly care when you're in a certain situation. If you're a renter, well, you can't retire because you're going to have to continue paying the rent. Um, and I, I think these two policies together, you know, really, really big intervention with regards to aging. I thought I'd say that because it's, it's potentially, again, another part of a, a broader coalition that might, might want these things. You know, we don't talk about sabbaticals enough. You know, in certain industries, you have sabbaticals. You know, people mm. can take out every seven years where it comes from. Um, they can take out time from work and they can try something else. And I think, wouldn't it be great if we could introduce that into the wider labor market? You have a right every decade to basically have a paid holiday from, from work. You know, some people might just want to hang out with their kids for a year. Some people might want to travel. They might want to start a new project. Um, but I, I think, you know, we, we should be trying to reach out to these desires and demands from people. Mm -hmm. A logistical question, though, because obviously this all sounds wonderful. 
we are living in a moment of relatively high inflation. So in late 2022, I think we had 10, 11% inflation in this country. Now it's gone down, it's about 8%. But we have inflation that is sufficiently high that it means people are getting poor because their, their wage increases aren't keeping up with price increases. How does a UBI deal with inflation? Is it simply indexed to CPI? Would you get this £65 a week and then it's it goes up in line with inflation a bit like a pension? Yeah, I think you know there's uh, there's some good work on this, you know, around obviously it's it's, an, it's a big question for the movement in general. The indexing makes sense. Um obviously for those if if anyone's listening here who thinks UBI might kind of co- help cause or stimulate inflation, um that's not the case. The, the the model I'm talking about is not about printing money, it's about redistributing cash. And um, we all know what's driving inflation now, it's not higher wages, you know, it's you know kind of basically profiteering effectively. Um when it comes to what the level would be, yeah, I think getting some indexing of some kind makes makes most sense. So you can't foresee a situation where, because this is the issue with regards to, say, the 70s. And and like say, we're a world away from the inflation of the 70s, which was, there wasn't a wage price spiral, but there were, because the labor was so strong, hit with the exogenous crisis of the oil shock, workers could quite happily say, actually, we want a lot more money. And they, and they got a lot more money. With something like a UBI, do you think it could be, there is an exogenous shock, there's a war, there's a catastrophic event, you know, climate breakdown really hits and all of a sudden politicians can say, well, sorry, this year we know inflation is 10%, but your UBI UBI is only going up 7%. But I suppose that's not really a counter argument, is it? Because we already have that with pensions anyway and nobody's Mm. saying get rid of public pensions. No, exactly. And also I think, you know, if this is a universal policy, it's going to be a lot more scrutiny on politicians who say, oh, we can't do that now because we have to do this thing over here. We're seeing right now a lot of of scrutiny on the idea of the wage price spiral, right? But not everyone is kind of involved in some of those, for example, disputes that trade unions are having about keeping up wages, if everyone is involved in thinking about what the level of UBI is uh, during a crisis, then you have to have a pretty good reason to say, actually, your livelihood is kind of in question at the moment. You're, there's a lot of kind of uncertainty in the economy, but don't worry, we're going to reduce your, your income because of some reason. Now, I think that's going to be a crucial element of why a basic income is, is, is a kind of um, an equality engine, is that every, everyone's going to be involved, everyone's going to be asking those questions. Will, you've persuaded me somewhat. I was a skeptic. I, I sort of still am for the larger sums, but I think for the entry level, why not? And I'm certainly a fan of the pilots. This was such an informative conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.